all right you are welcome to our lab um, today we'll be looking at the integumentary system which is commonly known as the skin the, the proper name is the integumentary system now one reason why we study the integumentary system is um, because it protects us we are protected by the integumentary system now exactly what is it that the integumentary system protects uh, it protects our internal tissues and internal organs it protects us from infectious microorganisms it protects us from dehydration there are other functions of the integumentary system that we are actually going to see eventually as we look at the different structures and parts of the of the integumentary system so here i have a model of the skin or the integumentary system the first thing i want us to note is the skin is divided into three layers the skin is divided into three layers um this is layer number one i'm sure you can see my pointer from here to here this layer number one this uppermost layer of the skin is referred to as the epidermis as the epidermis layer number two which is called the dermis is this uh, is this which is colored this portion that is colored um, this is light purple i think so this is light purple um just before the yellowish coloration so everything in here you cannot say pinkish which is pinkish before the yellowish coloration this is the dermis and then everywhere here where you actually have the yellowish coloration that is the hypodermis so the skin has three layers from the inside to the outside we have the hypodermis which is here represented by the yellow coloration then we have the light pinkish portion right in here in the middle that is called the dermis and right at the top right here we have the epidermis so those are the three layers of the skin now if we take our attention to the upper layer of the skin which we call the epidermis the epidermis has five sub layers five sub layers this is layer number one yeah this is the innermost sub layer right here this is the second one this is the third one this is number four and this is number five one more time the epidermis has five sub layers this is number one number two number three number four and number five now the the innermost sub layer So the innermost sub layer is called the stratum basale. Stratum basale is right here. It's called the stratum basale, and the outermost sub layer, the outermost sub layer, this one right here, right here, is called the stratum conium. Outermost sub layer. It's called the so when you touch yourself you are touching the epidermis but precisely you are touching the stratum conium good stratum conium now uh, most of the epidermis is dead most of the epidermis is dead the one sub layer of the epidermis that is not dead is the stratum basale this innermost sub layer this is stratum basale the stratum basale is living so the stratum basale, if you are here, this is a, this is a living sub layer. Now, uh, now stratum basale just simply means the uh, the basal layer. Just simply means the basal layer. And how do we know that this layer is living because it is the site for mitotic cell division 
it is a site for mitotic cell division. The upper layers of the skin that are above the stratum basale, because they are progressively dead as we move towards the surface of the skin, those cells that are dead, they are shed off. They have to be replaced. When those cells, when they die and they are shed off, they are replaced by the cells that are produced via mitotic cell division at the stratum basale. Next, and another thing we should note about the stratum, uh, about the epidermis, is that the epidermis, um, as we said already, that is, is mostly dead. Now, if you look at this stratum conium right here, which is actually stratum conium means stratified layer, um, no, hard layer or conified layer, stratum. So stratum conium means conified or hard layer. And the cells we have in the stratum conium, they are all dead cells. They are dead cells. And, and because this layer is hard or conified, it makes it protective. It makes it protective. Now, why is it necessary that the cells, that, that they are dead, um, so that we do not feel pain? so that we do not feel pain. If the, if the cells around this sub-layer of the skin, if they were alive, which means that they will be supplied with blood vessels and nerves, then if somebody touched you, you feel the pain, or even wearing clothes would have actually been a problem. So it is, it is important, it is important that they are, uh, the cells around that area, that, that sub-layer is actually dead. So, most of the epidemics is dead and how do we know that most of the epidemics is actually dead if you look at this carefully we do not have blood vessels and nerves in the epidemics we do not have blood vessels and nerves in the epidemics unlike what we are going to see in the other sub layers so we know that the epidemics is mostly dead because it does not have blood vessels and nerves no blood vessels no nerves Next sub layer, that will be the dermis, the pinkish portion of this model. Now you can see that the dermis is actually is the thickest portion of is the thickest portion of the skin. The dermis is the thickest portion of the skin. But let me bring another model here. Now, if you see here, uh, in this model, just like in the other model. All of this pinkish portion here this is the dermis but the dermis is subdivided into two sub layers the dermis is subdivided into two sub layers you can see in this model when i move this forward this is the upper sub layer so this is the upper sub layer and this is the lower sub layer of the dermis upper sub layer lower sub layer of the dermis the upper sub layer is called So dermis, here we have the papillary layer and then we have the reticular layer. So the lower layer is called the reticular layer. So reticular layer, lower layer, and this is the upper layer. If this model was made, if this if this model was made, um, uh, if this model was made according uh, proportionately, then we will see that the upper layer is smaller than the lower layer. The upper layer, which is the papillary layer, constitute uh, roughly twenty percent of the dermis, while the lower layer, the reticular layer, constitute roughly eighty percent of the dermis. So we can put here twenty uh, percent. I can put here 80%. Good. 
Now, the 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 dermis, unlike the epidermis, the dermis, unlike the epidermis, is living. The dermis, unlike the epidermis, is living. Remember, one of the reasons why we said the epidermis was not alive is because it lacked blood vessels and it lacked nerve cells. But we can see here in the dermis that we actually have blood vessels. So you can see the blue, the blue, these are blue blood vessels. They are called, these are veins. They transport oxygen, poor blood. These red vessels, they are called arteries. They transport oxygen-rich blood. Then this yellowish, then the yellowish structures you actually see here, these are, these are nerve fibers. These are nerve fibers and they terminate in their nerve cells. They terminate in their nerve cells. So, because we have the, uh, we have the venous system here, we have the arterial system here, and we have the nervous system here. So it makes the dermis, it makes the dermis a living component of the of the cell. Later on, we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about the components that are found here. Then we'll come down to our third layer, which is the innermost layer. It's called the hypodermis. The hypodermis is demarcated by the yellowish coloration. So what, what we see here, what you see as this yellowish coloration, all of this, these are fatty cells or adipose tissue. They are fatty cells or adipose tissue. You can see them here also. There they are. They are fatty cells or adipose tissue. So that is one way of actually recognizing the uh, the hypodermis. Now you also see here that the hypodermis is also alive. We can see nerve cells. You can see the blue blood vessels and the red blood vessels. That. We can also see here, these are the blue blood vessels, the red blood vessels, and we can see, uh, yeah, so, okay, in this particular model, we do not see, uh, we, do, we do not readily see any nerve cell here, but we can see the blood vessels here, so it means that the hypodermis is also alive. Okay. Now, we've gone through the three layers of the skin, the epidermis, dermis, and the hypodermis. What we want to look at next is we'll look at the skin appendages. Skin appendages. Skin appendages. Now, uh, appendages are structures that originate from the layers of the skin and they have a particular function. Uh, structures that originates from the skin and have a specific function. So skin appendages are they are structures that originate from the skin and they have specific functions. So they can originate from the epidermis or from the dermis or, or the hypodermis, but they end up having a specific function. So we'll go with the ones that we can actually see from this model very easily. Um, so we can start with this one over here. This is a sweat gland. This is a sweat gland. Sweat gland. Specifically, it will be called an acrine sweat gland. So, acrine sweat glands, they are used for sweating. This is an acrine sweat gland, they are used for sweating. And the, the biological process of sweating um, results in thermoregulation. Our normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. So, if our temperature goes significantly above 37 degrees Celsius, then sweating cools us down and brings back the temperature back to 37 degrees Celsius. So that's one of the functions of 
of the skin that is carried is carried out by the eccrine sweat gland. Now the next structure we want to look at is this one right over here. This is the sebaceous gland. This is the sebaceous gland. Over here, with this other model, this is a whole sebaceous gland. This is half of a sebaceous gland. So this is a sebaceous gland. This is the eccrine gland over here. So let's talk about the sebaceous gland now. Sebaceous gland. Sebaceous gland. Now, sebaceous gland, they, they are also called the oil gland. And they produce sebum or oils. So the technical name for oils is sebum. So sebaceous glands, this is sebaceous gland over here, they produce sebum or they produce oils. Now these oils are necessary for the lubrication of our bodies. Uh, against cracks. So this sebaceous glands here, they produce sebum. So, sebum, which is uh, the technical name for oils, they are lubricants. They are lubricants and they protect our bodies from cracks. If our body has cracks anywhere, those cracks, they serve as entryways for microorganisms that can cause diseases in our body. So the, uh, so the lubricants, they ensure that our body does not crack. That way we are protected from microbial invasion. Now the next thing will the next um, the, the next organelles the the, the next uh, skin appendage we want to look at here. Look at let's look at this one over here. This is a nerve cell. This is a nerve cell. This is a nerve cell. This are uh, uh, these are the nerve fibers that actually ends up with the nerve cell. Another nerve cell over here. Another one over here. Another one over here. So the nerve cells. Uh, on this on, on this other model on this other model we can see you can see the, the nerve cells over there and this another one right over here yes right so nerve cells So the nerve cells, they are part of the nervous system. They are part of the nervous system in the skin, part of the nervous system in the skin. And their function there is uh, sensation. And their function there is sensation. So they enable us, you can feel, um, you can feel hot or cold. You can feel pain, pressure, etc. So if you're able to feel pain on your body, you can able to you can to, you are you are able to feel that you are either warm or you are cold, or you're able to feel some pressure on your body. All of that is because of the representative of the nervous system that we have in our skin, in the uh, um, in the nature of the the nerve cells and their nerve fibers. The next skin appendage we want to look at is the hair follicle. This is an open hair follicle right here. This is a hair follicle right here. And this is a hair follicle right here. This is an open hair follicle right there. Hair follicle.
So there are there are two main functions of the hair follicle. So the 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 hair um the, the hair grows from the hair follicle. The hair follicle also contains uh, pigments that give the hair its coloration. So for example, if you have black hair or you have red hair, etc. etc. It is because of the type of pigment that you actually have here in the hair follicle. So when the hair is actually made here, it is also supplied with the pigmentation that gives it its that gives it its coloration. Good. Then of course this is the hair right here. This is the hair right here that you can see that it emanates or it originates from the hair from the hair follicle. Why do we need to have hair in our skin? Look at hair. So, um, our uh, hair, hair is protective. Hair is insulative. So, you have, in other words, it conserves um, hair, um, heat energy in the body. And hair can also be used for identification. Identification in the sense that you can identify somebody based on their hair texture. You can identify somebody based on their hair color. So, those are some functions that uh, hair actually has um then here this is the erector pili muscle this is the erector pili muscles erector pili muscles you can see that uh you can see that uh, this is a skeletal muscle from a shape this is a skeletal muscle you can see that it is directly attached to the hair follicle it's directly attached to the hair follicle if we come over here the same we have here this is um, this is the erector pili muscle. This is the erector pili muscle. You can see that they are directly attached to the hair follicle. Now, they are sometimes you can see that your the hair in your body either it may stand at an edge or it could be curved. So, when the erector pili muscles, depending on whether they are contracting or relaxing that would determine whether your hair whether it's going to be going to start at an edge or it's going to be going to be curved now oftentimes when you are cold then you look at the hair on your body the edges they seem to curve inwards they seem to curve inwards the reason why they do that is so that they can actually conserve so they can conserve heat energy All right um another thing we want to look at here it's um we can see that we have uh, we have a lot of blood vessels in here. So within the within the epidermis, no, rather within the hypodermis and the dermis, we have a lot of blood vessels, especially in the dermis. The same over here. These are in the dermis right here. We can see that we have a lot of blood vessels right here. Now one uh, so the we said earlier on that the op the upper portion of the of the skin, which is the epidermis, that is essentially dead. So it means it does not need blood, and it does not have blood vessels. So, and we know that um, in humans, up to five percent of blood is stored. In the skin so out, out up to five percent of blood is stored in the skin but this so the other way so the skin acts as a blood reservoir so the skin acts as a blood reservoir reservoir here means storage reservoir here means storage so the skin acts as a blood reservoir but the skin does not need all of this blood so what happens is if there is a shortage of blood anywhere in the skin then blood will be transferred from the skin to that part of the body 
So it acts as a reserve for blood in the body. All right. Um, essentially, um, it looks as if those are we've, we're, we've looked at the main layers of the skin. We've looked at the skin appendages and their functions. So the the next thing we want to look at, we want to look at the um, homeostatic imbalances of the skin. Homeostatic imbalances of the skin. look at homeostatic imbalances of the skin um so by now by now we already we already know that we already know that the skin has three layers so this is a mini stroke a mini model of the skin the skin has uh, three layers so this is layer number one from here to here this is the this is the epidermis from here to here this is the dermis from here to here this is the hypodermis so, um, hypodermis from here to here, dermis, this portion, epidermis, this portion. Two main, two main common uh, homeostatic imbalances of the skin are uh, uh, skin burns and skin cancers so two main common homeostatic imbalances of the skin they are skin burns and skin cancers now in terms of skin burns that of the burns we have first degree second degree and third degree burns so we have uh, uh, skin burns are classified into three first degree, second degree and third degree this classification is based on the location of the skin burn by location here we mean which layers of the skin are involved now remember if we have we have three layers of the skin so this is number one so that's layer number one this is layer number two and this is layer number three so epidermis this is dermis and this is hypodermis one two three so a first degree burn will be one that is restricted to layer number one so a first degree burn will be, will be restricted here will be restricted to the epidermis a second degree burn will cut across the epidermis and the upper portions of the dermis so this will be second degree burn and then a third degree burn will go all around will cut across all three will cut across all three layers of the skin First degree burn, second degree burn, and third degree burn. Look at this model right here. These are burns right here. So you can see that over here, it starts from here to here. So it is limited to the epidermis. So this will be a first degree burn. You see this one? It moves from the epidermis right down to the dermis so this will be a second degree burn and then over here it starts from the epidermis it goes across the dermis and then it actually ends with the hypodermis so this will be a third degree burn first degree limited to the epidermis second degree limited to the epidermis and the dermis third degree goes from the epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Skin cancers. 
Next one. Skin cancer. Carcinoma. So we have three types of uh, we have three common types of skin cancer. We have basal cell carcinoma. We have uh, squamous cell carcinoma, and we have melanoma. And we have melanoma. The basal cell carcinoma is restrictive. It is found. It is, it is found in the it's found in the last layer of cells of the epidermis. The squamous cell carcinoma um, transverses from the from the epidermis down to the upper layers of the dermis, while the melanoma traverses all three layers of the of the skin. So the uh, basal cell carcinoma is benign or is stagnant does not spread so it's limited to the epidemics only squamous cell carcinoma it can spread if it is not treated that's why we that's why we that's why normally you, you can it can spread from the the epidemics to the dermis they will have melanoma melanoma um is the spreading type of cancer so you can move from the epidemics right down to the to the hypodermis. Now, if we come back to this model right here, so over here, so this will represent basal cell carcinoma. This will because it's restricted to the epidermis. This will represent squamous cell carcinoma because it moves from the epidermis to the dermis. And over here, this will represent a melanoma because it spreads across all three layers of the skin. So these are the these are the three most common um, um, homeostatic imbalances of the skin. It will be needless to add that melanoma is the most dangerous type of skin cancer that we have, and because sometimes it can be resistant to uh, to treatment. Um, also, third degree burn because it affects all layers of the skin. It's one of the most dangerous type of burns that one can have also. So if you have 10 degree burns, they'll give you very, very special attention uh, as compared to if you had first degree burns. Right, so that concludes our, um, our uh, demonstrative lab of the intergumentary system.